Well, this morning I'm, I'm speaking to you uh, out of uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses uh, 20 through 30, and uh, Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 through 16. Uh, and the title of my message this morning is, When the Minister is in Jail. Uh, I can relate to that. I've been there. I'm not real proud of that, but I've been there. Yeah. Drinking and driving when I wasn't even old enough to drink, let alone drive. But my dad rescued me. Yes, he did. But he said, one time, just once, you're on your own after that. He said, the truth of it is, I should let you rot right there, because that's what you deserve. But my daddy rescued me, just like the father rescues us. Occasionally, something happens in a community that uh, uh, changes the conversation of people. Uh, in fact, it maybe just creates one conversation and something that everybody's talking about. Uh, this can be something uh, unusually uh, positive, or such as when, when an elderly couple, not, not so long ago, not here in this state, but uh, uh, elderly couple on food stamps wins the lottery. Yeah. They won $37 million. And uh, before you know it, everybody's talking about it. Couldn't happen to a nicer couple. Uh, yeah, but uh, what are they going to do with it? Uh, I don't know. But then all of a sudden, you see some movement in the wood and the woodwork. People are coming out. Oh, you remember me, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm your cousin. My mother was your sister by a previous marriage, uh, uh, twice removed. Yeah, all that kind of thing. We're close. Yeah, we're really close. Yeah. 37 million, huh? Yeah, we're a real close family. <laughs> Everybody talks about it. Uh, could be something uh, unusual. I read about a 53 year old woman who had triplets. Think about that. And the people talk about it. They say, uh, why would she do that? And th three babies, when she's got grandkids in school. You know, I don't know what she's going to do with those three babies. I can tell you what she'll do. She'll raise them. Yeah. Everybody talks about it. It can be a tragedy, a, a natural disaster, a hurricane, a hurricane. We've heard that saying, is your power back on yet? Yeah. Nope, yours. They say it's going to be another week. Uh, did you lose anything in that last, last tornado? Yeah, took the roof right off and messed up the second floor. Can't find my cat. Hallelujah for that. And, uh, and the basement has 22 inches of water in it. Yeah. Someone else says, yeah, we lost everything. Big tree came down through our house, but we're all alive. Thank God. Thank God. I'm grateful for that. You see, everybody talks about that stuff. Could be a human disaster. It could be a sex, and, se uh, sex scandal that, that rocked the, the Roman Catholic Church or the sex sex. Uh, why can I say that? Because it's a bad word. <laughs> the sex scandal that that rocked our little town of Owasso and devastated the, the Salvation Army. You remember that. Such tragedies create a conversation. But those kind of conversations, nobody really knows what to say.
sometimes things happen uh, that create a, a single mind in a community. And that's the way it is in our text that we read today. We're looking at that little church in, in Philippi, which was located in now what we call the, the northern part of, of, of Greece. They'd met on Sunday morning for worship, uh, but there's only one conversation going around today. Our minister is in jail. Paul's in jail. That's all there is to talk about. They know where he is in jail, but we don't. The scriptures don't tell us. But we know that he's somewhere being held by the Roman government, and that he's awaiting trial. It might be Caesarea, it could be Ephesus, uh, it might even be Rome. But that's all the church people can talk about. They don't have much of a Sunday school lesson because all they can talk about is Paul. They don't listen to the sermon be, uh, because all they're thinking about is, is Paul in prison. Some of them start remembering. Uh, you know, I, I'm a charter member of this church. Yeah, I was, I was one of them women down by the prayer place. Uh, the river that Paul came by uh, when he first visited this town. He came to where we were having a prayer service and, and he talked to us about Jesus. Quite a number of us became uh, believers. Uh, Lydia was there. You know, we had our service in her condo for a while before she moved. But now we've grown and we're, we're in this place. Paul baptized me. Oh, he did? Yeah, he did. Well, Paul baptized me too. Yeah. See, some of them now are getting emotional, walking around the building and seeing things that remind them of Paul. Left his cap on, on the rack in the hall. Uh, that's Paul's cap, yeah. Left a scroll of a letter back in the, in the study. Everything they see reminds them of him. There's his shawl. You know, he got awful cold most of the time, and he's had a hard time with his health, and uh, he wore that shawl, and it's still here. It's something like that novel. I don't know if you've ever read it. Um, it's called A Death in the Family. On the morning after the, the, his father's death, the seven-year-old boy says, I don't like breakfast. I used to like breakfast. I like to listen at breakfast. You know, all of us eating together. I like the sound of that. Now it's so quiet at breakfast. He smells a greasy spot on, on the back of the chair where where his father always sat, runs his finger uh, around inside an ashtray. Everything reminds him of his father's absence. So here we have it. Paul's in jail. Some of the church members uh, become reflective. You know, that's the way it is for all of us. You never know. We're just like birds and, uh, and fly out in the dark, come through a, a house of light, and then back into the dark. That's the way it is. Paul was here a while, started the church, but now he's gone. Isn't that the way life is? You know, every year, in the fall, I, I get to thinking about uh, those kind of things too. Seems like a long time from, from May to December. But when you reach September, the days get a whole lot shorter. The days dwindle down to a, a previous few and I get to thinking 
about Paul, and I get to thinking about myself. Some of the young people there want to know why they put Paul in prison. So the adults try to explain it. But how do you explain it? They, they really can't. Here's a man whose whole life, night and day, is given to the work of God, and he's in jail, awaiting trial, and very likely, awaiting death. If anybody was faithful to the gospel, it was Paul, and now he's in jail. This was the man who, who, who dragged his, his crippled, aching, beaten body across two continents to preach the gospel. Now all of his travels have stopped, and he just sits there. Think about Paul uh, sitting in that cell. A man who was always on the move. He wrote to the church in Rome. I'm coming to Rome, but I'm not stopping there. I want you people to help me go on to Spain. And I'm running out of places over here to preach. So I just have to keep on going. But now, he stopped. You know, when I think of this story, uh, my mind goes a little goofy sometimes, but when I think of this story, I think of, uh, of that great Indian leader, Geronimo. I don't know why exactly. Uh, he was a great Indian chieftain who was put in a cell in Fort Sill in, in Lawton, Oklahoma. I visited that, that place a long time ago uh, where he was imprisoned. It's a national park now, and, and a ranger has to let you in. There's no flooring in the cell, just a dirt floor and one little barred window way up, so high that you can't reach it. But when you look out, all you can see is just the sky. And that great man, an apostle, if you will, of freedom for his tribe, was in there. Just beneath the tiny window is a deep trench. Now, I asked the ranger about that. What's this trench for? They told me Geronimo paced back and forth. And he made that trench. And now, here's Paul. Paul's in jail. Wonder if he's banging his tin cup on the on the bars of the cell. Hey, have I got any mail today? I doubt it again. How are the older folks in Philippi going to ex explain that? You know, you can't explain. Some in the church at, at Philippi worried. What's our church going to do? I don't think we're going to make it now with Paul along. We're going to go down. We're never going to get anybody else like Paul. I don't know what we're going to do. What's going to happen to our church? I just don't know where Paul going. While they worried and, and crying and going through all of that, a man comes into church, a pale, sickly man. His name is Arapiditus. He's a member of the church. And when the fir church first heard uh, uh, Paul was in prison, they sent Arapiditus to him. Go over there and see what he needs, they said. Help him out. But Arapiditus himself got sick, uh, uh, deathly sick. In fact, he almost died. But when he was well enough to travel, uh, Paul him sent him back to, uh, to Philippi with a letter that said, uh, I got enough troubles. Uh, I really don't need a, a, a sick deacon to, to help me out. <laughs> Are you good deacons listening? Yeah. Uh, 
But Paul thanked him anyway for his efforts. So Arapiditus comes back. And when he enters the church, the people say, what are you doing here? I have a letter from Paul. And he wants you to read it in worship today. And this is what Paul said. Get your mind off me. I'm not the center of the church. If you're worried about how I'm doing, I'm doing well. I'm doing fine. I'm prepared. I'm prepared if I live. I'm prepared if I die. With everything I have gone through with this aching body, it would, I would be glad to be free of it and to have angels take me to my rest. Death is no threat. In fact, if I had my way, I'd rather die and be with Christ. But I think God has a lot more work for me to do, so I'll probably return to work with you someday. In fact, I'm confident of it. Until that time comes, though, quit thinking about me. No church can survive built around the preacher. The church is built around Jesus Christ. I'm the one in prison. Christ is not in prison. Christ is the savior of the church. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Preachers will come and preachers will go. Young ones and old ones, good ones and bad ones. But the church is the church. You have Christ. I want you to prove all the prophets of doom wrong. Prove that they're wrong when they say the attendance will go down now that Paul is not here. Prove them wrong when they say the offerings are going to stop now that Paul is not here. Prove them wrong when they say, I, 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 I think that the members will kind of drift off now that Paul's not here. Prove them wrong. Stand together, side by side. Be fervent in what you do. Two things are absolutely essential to the church. Jesus Christ and human need. In that place where, where the church dwells are the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, the powerful and the powerless. There are those who are educated and there, there are those who are ignorant. I, I fall pretty much on that latter part. There are those who believe and those who don't believe. There are the high and the mighty, uh, the lowly, uh, whom nobody knows. And in between all of that, is the church of Jesus Christ. The church is called to, to help uh, both the haves and the have-nots, the powerful and the powerless. The church is to be the gospel for all of these people. And as long as you have Christ and as long as you have needs, you have the church. Paul said that the real proof of his ministry is how the church works in his absence. I was thinking uh, many years ago, it was around, or I think around 1969. I went to uh, uh, to a conference. Actually, it was a, a National Association of uh, uh, Congregational Christian Churches uh, they had their annual meeting in, in Lansing. At the beginning of the meeting, uh, one evening, uh, a young woman began the program with the devotional. Uh, I didn't know her. She was a young woman, I'd say probably in her mid-20s. Uh, she had pale, blonde, straight hair. She was thin, wore no makeup and had a very soft voice. And when she got up to give the devotional, she had one of them big yellow legal pads, and uh, I thought, oh boy, we're, we're here for the night. <laughs> you know how you think those things. You know, because someone said that everyone has a sermon in them. You know, and they're just waiting for an opportunity to get it out. Her voice was low. I could hardly hear. And I thought for sure that she was speaking in another language. And then she spoke in another language. 
and then in another language, and yet in another language. I don't know how many languages she spoke. Uh, I, I didn't count them, but there were, there were several. And what she was doing is saying the same thing over and over again in all of these languages of the world. I suppose she said this one thing at least six or seven times in different languages. It was one sentence. The last time she spoke it, she spoke it in English. And she said just these words, Mommy, I'm hungry. I thought about what she said as I, uh, I drove home that night first highway billboard I saw uh, going out of Lansing was all you can eat for $4.99. But in my head, I was hearing, Mommy, I'm hungry. Paul said, you have Christ and you have all of these human needs. Think about that. So get your mind off me. That's what Paul says. Get your mind off me. Now, I know I haven't really been <clears throat> preaching to you today, but uh, just kind of telling you about uh, our brother Paul. Uh, but I think it makes a lot of sense, don't you? I think it does. Let's pray. Dear Father, uh, open our hearts to your healing word, uh, our minds, Lord, to your uh, informing word, uh, our souls to, to your uh, renewing word that we might know only our Lord Jesus Christ and him alone, and in following him, go out into the world, meeting the needs of those around us. In the name of Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen.